The last 24 hours have seen more evidence that the Republicans in the United States are going to gain control of the House of Representatives. They're just a few seats away from an outright majority in the House of Representatives and more appointments from Donald Trump. Um, um, Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy, the two um, entrepreneurs, have both been appointed to uh, positions in the Trump administration. They're going to lead a government efficiency, a department of government, government efficiency, whose purpose will be to um, um, carry out to slash rules, bureaucracy and spending. That is what we're told. In other words, to conduct a major cutting down of the government of the United States to bring it to a more um, efficient and smaller state than the one, it, the bloated state in which it is in today. Now, I should say that I wish these two people well. I've had the benefit of appearing on a program uh, with, it, with both of these two people at the same time, hosted by David Sachs on Spaces. I was impressed by the intelligence of both Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy. I don't know to what extent either of them have experience of working inside government or working inside government bureaucracies as a grizzled veteran of that sort of thing. I would say that they're going to face challenges the like of which they have never experienced before and that they should not be under the mistaken illusion that a bureaucracy, a governmental bureaucracy, is at all like the kind of bureaucracies that they're probably familiar with in the various private businesses that they have managed. They perhaps also need to be aware of the fact that public bureaucracies serve profoundly different functions and have completely different rhythms from what you tend to find in the administrative bureaucracies of private companies. So I hope they come to this with an open mind. I understand what they're going to try and do. Um, it's not going to be at all easy and they need to be careful also that if they do conduct a slimming down of government that they don't disorganize and create chaos instead, um, especially given the fact that they're going to meet plenty of resistance, whatever it is that they try to do. Anyway, that's Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy with those words of advice and caution. As I said, I've been quite impressed by them both when I uh, heard them um, explain their views on that program. Um, I wish them both well and we'll see what it is that they achieve. There have been other appointments um, of a perhaps more conventional kind, or at least maybe not so conventional actually, but at least appointments to uh, various positions in the US government, more traditional positions of the US government. One very unusual appointment one that I think few people had anticipated is that of the appointment of Pete Hegseth um, to um, the position of Secretary of Defence. Um, Pete Hegseth, again, is someone I know very little about. I understand he's a Fox News host. I know that he's been an officer, military officer, I believe in the National Guard, but I gather that he has served, um, in, he has actually served the United States and been in action in the Middle East. So he's somebody with a military background and he has, from what I've heard, been an outspoken defender of the rights of veterans and is someone who is well informed about the opinions of US veterans and um, of their concerns. 
from what I know of the opinions of US military veterans, pretty much all of them that I've come across, and I've come across a random sample of them, I should stress, but pretty much all of them are united in one, on one issue, which is that they want to see an end of the forever wars and a scaling down of the interventionism, the military interventionism conducted by the United States over the last 10, 15, 20 plus years. So perhaps Pete Hegseth is aware of that. He is, I would say, however, with all you know, real respect for him, uh, as I said, I don't know much about him, uh, he is an unconventional choice. Uh, the sort of people who tend to lead the US military, uh, Department of Defense tend to be high-level politicians, people with congressional backgrounds, either as senators or representatives, or people who have had ex backgrounds in the military-industrial complex, or people who have been senior military officers, generals, and that sort of thing in the US armed forces. Um, Donald Trump's first uh, defense secretary in his first term was, of course, a general, General Mattis. Uh, President Biden's defense secretary was another general, General Austin. Um, George W. Bush's defense secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, was a very, very um, important figure in the political and military establishment in the United States. Um, he'd been around for a very long time. Other people who have held that post have come from backgrounds like that. Pete Hegseth comes into the Department of the Defense of Defense as a total outsider. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe he will come in with fresh thinking and um, will know, as I said, what a lot of the people who have been serving soldiers in the US Army think. But again, I wonder whether Pete Hegseth's background fully prepares him for the challenge he's going to face bringing under control the sprawling bureaucracy of the Pentagon and its various other uh, satellite institutions, amongst which one has to include the military-industrial complex. Perhaps the idea is that Hegseth will be working very closely with people like Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy, who do have, obviously, a strong background in management and that these appointments are intended to complement each other. Well, we shall see. And of course, we also had yesterday confirmation that Mike Waltz will indeed be become President Trump's new national security advisor. Um, he served in Congress. He's a, been a representative in the House of Representatives. He's also been a military officer. He's um, also seen action, or so I understand. And I've been taking an interest in his views over the last couple of hours, 24 hours. And, well, he seems to be somebody who's very much still focused on many of the issues that were thrown up by the war on terror, the war on, against Islamic jihadist movements across the Middle East. Um, he obviously has some experience there. He has very strong views um, on those issues. He's got very strong views about um, Iran. He's very hostile to Iran or so I can sit from what I can see. He also has very strongly hostile views towards China. We'll come to that in a moment. Um, he has been loyal to um, Donald Trump. And from what I can tell, he has become an increasing skeptic over the last year or so 
of US support for Ukraine. He's increasingly spoken out about the fact that giving Ukraine more and more support was a case of sending, throwing good money after bad and throwing weapons in relatively short supply after previous supplies of weapons that had been used to little effect. So that's a number of the appointments that have taken place over the last 24 hours. Important appointments, and I'm not even started to discuss and won't discuss in this program, the various appointments to Donald Trump's economic team, which is now clearly starting to take shape. In fact, I have to say that in this administration, Trump is moving much faster to fill the top posts that he did back in 2016 after he was elected then. He seems to have a much clearer idea of whom he wants to see at the top of the US government and who he wants to work for him than he did when he was previously elected in 2016. However, one person so far about whom there was much speculation yesterday that a decision had been made to appoint him to what is actually, as I understand it, technically the top post in the US government after the president himself, the post of Secretary of State. One person, Marco Rubio, is still being left hanging. We're still waiting to see whether those rumours and reports we were hearing yesterday that he was going to be appointed Secretary of State, whether those reports are correct. And today, the British magazine, The Spectator, has published a piece by Freddie Gray. Why hasn't Marco Rubio been announced as Trump's Secretary of State yet? Question mark. And then there's a long article, which I'm not going to uh, discuss in detail, but it suggests that there might be all sorts of explanations for this, one of which is that the uh, stronger, more loyalist MAGA figures within the Trump team have balked at the suggestion that Marco Rubio, who um, has not always seen eye to eye with Donald Trump, should be appointed to this very senior position. Um, there's some suggestions that, well, I will read, there are whispers of squabbles breaking out behind the scenes over the Secretary of State role. It seems as if Rubio had indeed got the nod on Monday, but the news upset MAGA loyalists who are not convinced by Marco's apparent transformation from new American century primacist, that's to say, arch neocon to American firster. One insider suggested last night, I wonder who that insider is, <laughs> whether he even exists. One insider suggested last night that the odds of Rubio becoming America's next Secretary of State were dropping by the second. It's said that Rick Grinnell, one of Trump's favorite men, gay men, and his former director of intelligence is leading the pushback, though Grinnell fiercely denied that claim on Twitter X last night. Yet the longer Trump waits to make the announcement, the more such gossip spreads. And then the article then goes on to say that there's been, um, it's not unlike Trump to keep us all in suspense, to perhaps keep Rubio himself in suspense, reminding Rubio who the boss ultimately is or is going to be, and playing a game of cat and mouse with Marco Rubio, and perhaps one could almost say with the rest of us as well. Anyway, there's been no announcement as of the mo time of making of this program. That doesn't mean that Marco Rubio is not going to be picked eventually. Maybe he is indeed the person that Donald Trump has decided upon. Maybe he did 
make that decision on Monday and then changed his mind over the course of Tuesday. And maybe today someone else, perhaps Rick Grinnell, or someone else, Eldridge Colby, for example, or someone else <laughs> unknown to me will be appointed instead. We shall just have to wait and see. The decision is one made by Donald Trump. And on this issue, as far as I can see, he's keeping his counsel very much to himself. Now, having said that, we have got some ideas now as to the nature of the people that Donald Trump is appointing to his foreign policy team. I discussed this briefly in my programme yesterday, but I'm going to just repeat a few things and just enlarge on them. So far, the people he is appointing are people with a track record of loyalty to himself. That, by the way, includes the new director of the CIA, Radcliffe, who was one of the people who, when briefly director of national intelligence in Donald Trump's first administration, also strongly supported Donald Trump and pushed back heavily against those sections, those very extensive and powerful sections of the US intelligence community, which was seeking in some way to discredit or destabilize Donald Trump in the ways that we all remember. The people Trump is picking up to this point are people who have been consistently loyal to himself. That, by the way, might argue against Rubio becoming Secretary of State, because though for some time now, Rubio has reconciled with Trump, has emerged as a supporter of Trump's, it would be true to say also that he has had a history of being opposed to Trump in the past, and it looks as if this time Trump is unwilling to take the risks at the risk of appointing to his administration anybody who he thinks might in any possible respect be potentially unreliable or who has a history of being unreliable. So he's going for people who are loyal to himself. That applies to Stefanik. It applies to... Um, uh, uh, Waltz, <laughs> it applies to Hegseth, it applies to Radcliffe, to all of these people. And given Trump's experience in his first administration, when he did go for more conventional establishment people, McMasters, Mattis, Rex, Tillerson, um, and uh, uh, and John Bolton, of course, um, only to bitterly regret appointing them later. Well, one can see why Donald Trump would have done it in this way this time. The other thing I'm going to say about these people is that, yes, in general, though to varying degrees, they are hostile to China. Um, Marco Rubio, if he's appointed, especially so, perhaps. But I would suggest that a more unifying thread that brings them all together, apart from loyalty to Donald Trump personally, is fierce support for Israel and strong antipathy towards Iran. I have to say that reminds me very much of the very first person that Donald Trump appointed to the post of National Security Advisor when he became president the first time, who was Michael Flynn. Michael Flynn, former general in the U.S. military, well, general in the U.S. military, uh, former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, skeptic about the Syrian adventure, um, critical of that adventure to the extent that it turned many people in the Obama administration against him. A person who 
unquestionably wanted an easing of relations with Russia and appears to have had some desire to mend fences with Russia, if only to find ways to distance Russia from China. Of course, back in 2016, China and Russia were much less close than they are today. But anyway, as well as being all of those things, um, Michael Flynn was a fierce supporter of Israel and a very, very fierce adversary of Iran. And I have to say that the pattern with these appointments seems to repeat that from the first term. A strong loyalty to Israel, strong hostility to Iran, and this time, loyalty to Donald Trump first and foremost. Now, that may mean, I'm afraid it could mean, a open-ended commitment, a continuation of this, policy that the Biden administration disastrously under, uh, started upon back in October last year, directly after the Hamas attack on Israel, of giving the Israelis a blank check, perhaps even, <laughs> even supporting the Israelis in some of the things that they might be planning to do, for example, against Iran, I'm afraid that is now a real possibility. But what all of these people also seem to have in common, and that goes back to Michael Flynn, but it includes all of the others that we've just been speaking about, to a greater or lesser extent, is that they are not so enthusiastic about an open-ended confrontation with Russia. I want to stress these are not fans of Russia or of President Putin. It's just that this isn't quite as important to them as these other issues are. In the case of Hegseth and Waltz, they've had experience in the Middle East, as by the way, Michael Flynn also did. And this seems to have shaped their views and determined their priorities and played a role in developing their hostility towards Iran. So <laughs> their primary focus looks to be the Middle East and their fierce loyalty is to Donald Trump. If Marco Rubio is appointed Secretary of State, then that process will be taken further still. And we will have at a sensitive time in the Middle East, and that's an understatement, a very fraught time in the Middle East would be a more accurate statement. We will have an administration coming into office in January, which is determinately and single-mindedly supportive of Israel, just to say. Now, that might fail to take into account some of the changes in the Middle East, very extensive and profound changes that have taken place across the Middle East since Donald Trump was first elected president way back in 2016. Donald Trump, of course, um, pursued a policy of trying to establish diplomatic relations or foster diplomatic relations between various Arab states and Israel. He transferred the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, in effect recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, a controversial step at the time. He brokered, or his administration brokered, the so-called Abraham Accords, which resulted in Israel establishing diplomatic relations with certain of the Gulf Arab monarchies, though importantly, not Saudi Arabia. I have to say, if Donald Trump thinks, if the people around him think that they can simply return to that, 
then they may find that they're facing more resistance than they expected. In my program yesterday, I mentioned that the chief of staff of the Saudi military has just visited Iran, where he had a meeting with the chief of staff of the Iranian military. And the two seem to have a friendly meeting and agreed to cooperate, to have their armed forces cooperate and work with each other. Well, an even more important Saudi, in fact, a much more important Saudi, uh, spoke uh, in Riyadh at the summit meeting, a, a joint summit meeting of the Arab League and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Uh, they held a joint summit meeting in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia on the 11th of November. And at that meeting, that more important Saudi, MBS himself, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, Prime Minister and de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, made absolutely clear his opposition, which of course means Saudi Arabia's opposition to any further Israeli attacks on Iran. In fact, he used the following words. He said that Israel should, quote, respect the sovereignty of the sisterly Islamic Republic of Iran and not violate its lands. Now, that is remarkable language coming from a Saudi prince, especially such a senior Saudi prince, coming from the man who is in line to become Saudi Arabia's next king. Um, a couple of years ago, it would have been unthinkable that a Saudi ruler should refer to Iran as the sisterly Islamic Republic of Iran. But MBS did. It's a sign of the fundamental shift in the political mood in the Middle East that has taken place, especially over the last year, and of the extent to which Iran's outreach to the Arab states, backed by the influence of the BRIC states, China and Russia, has had an effect. And it's also, of course, a product of the revulsion that is widely felt across the Arab world at what has been taking place on the Palestinian territories, in Gaza and in Lebanon since the Hamas attack um, in October last year. So if President Trump and his new team think that There'll be strong Arab support from the conservative Arab monarchies for further attacks on Iran. On the contrary, they could find themselves very disappointed and they could find that the priority of the Arab states at this time, including the Gulf monarchies, is to bring about a, re bring a return to stability in the Middle East which means, from their point of view, the establishment of a ceasefire in southern Lebanon, a ceasefire in Gaza, a pull <coughs> pullback by the <coughs> Israeli military from both of these places, a calming of the situation in the remaining Palestinian territories, and perhaps a diplomatic moves towards beginning negotiations to try to finally agree on the creation of a Palestinian state, perhaps through the vehicle of an international peace conference that the Chinese and the Russians are both currently advocating. So anyway, we will see whether the new Trump administration um, is aware of those realities, <coughs> those Middle East realities, and how 
it will adjust to them. Incidentally, and whilst I'm on the subject of the situation in the Middle East, I ought to say that, again, I'm hearing these incredibly contradictory things about what exactly is happening, especially in the fighting <clears throat> in southern Lebanon. So is the Israeli authorities, a couple of days ago, I think it's about two days ago, announced that Israel has been enormously successful in depleting and destroying large sections of Hezbollah's military arsenal. Perhaps that is true. For the moment, I don't myself see much evidence of it, but perhaps the Hezbollah still has some weapons left, even if its stockpiles have been depleted, as the Israelis say, and that is why they're still able to continue to launch their missile strikes on Israel and to prevent people in Israel, in northern Israel, returning to their homes. Hezbollah, for its part, again, about two days ago, issued, made a claim that the Israeli army has so far failed to gain, to occupy, to securely occupy a single village in southern Lebanon. Now, I don't know whether or not that is true. I suspect that is something that others can verify who've been following the fighting more closely than I have done. But again, if it is true, it would be an interesting fact. Maybe it's not the Israeli objective, by the way, to occupy villages. I don't know. I would be surprised, though, if it wasn't. But anyway, one way or the other, uh, that is what Hezbollah is saying. It may be true or it may not be true. If it is true, then it does suggest to me that the Israeli military operation in southern Lebanon is not going at all well. So, anyway, that's what I want to say today about the state, the situation with the Trump administration, the f emerging Trump administration, and the situation in the Middle East, which <coughs> I suspect for them is going to be a very important priority, perhaps the most important priority. To repeat again my point, point I've made previously, um, I've heard reports that Donald Trump has decided to delegate the handling of the Ukraine problem to his vice president, J.D. Vance, which I think is a wise move. I think Vance is very well informed about the Ukraine situation and comes across to me as a very competent pair of hands and that Trump instead is intending to focus on the Middle East issues himself. And as I said, he's picking all these people, presumably with that intention in mind. I, I hope that he will realize very quickly the change in the political and geopolitical situation in the Middle East since he was last president, and that he won't test the situation by supporting Israeli moves, further Israeli moves, or, for, or further moves by Prime Minister Netanyahu and his government to escalate the situation there, because I fear that if he does, that will again absorb the full energies of his administration, perhaps draw the United States into further conflicts in the Middle East, which I guarantee will be extremely unpopular with Donald Trump's electoral base. So anyway, that's where we are with the, the Middle East, with the formation of the new Donald Trump administration. As for China, they are going to watch and wait, contrary to some opinions that I've seen ex expressed. I don't think the Chinese are particularly worried 
about tariffs. Gordon Chang, he who has been predicting the imminent collapse of China since the late 1990s, uh, has written another piece today in the Daily Telegraph saying that Donald Trump's arrival and the sanctions he's going to impose are going to be the single thing that is going to provoke the final terminal crisis of the of Xi Jinping's government in China. Um, I don't give any credence to that at all. I think the Chinese will comfortably absorb sanctions. Um, most of their trade is no longer with the United States, contrary to what many people assume. And I think China's already working out its, and has for some time, been working out its alternative trading arrangements with many countries, and is busy anyway, doing all kinds of things within its own economy that are not particularly well understood outside China. I'm not going to dwell on that um, in this program. But anyway, <coughs> suffice to say, that I think the Chinese, their policy with Donald Trump and with this US government is the same as the one they have followed with all other US governments going all the way back to Richard Nixon's time, which is watch and wait wait for the Americans to make mistakes, to get bogged down in the Middle East or in Ukraine or wherever, and to pick up the pieces whilst the Americans remain distracted. It's what the Chinese have consistently done, and it's worked well for them up to now, and I don't see any reason, even in right of recent events, why they would want to change it. Now, that now brings us back to the situation with respect to Ukraine. Now, as I said, none of the people who Trump is appointing come across to me as especially friendly to Russia. Uh, it's just that their priorities appear to be focused elsewhere. All of them collectively seem to take the view that Ukraine is a drain on American resources and a distraction from more important things. That is the reason, basically, why they want to distance the United States from this crisis in Ukraine. I also get the strong impression that most of them collectively, including Trump himself, have little time for President Zelensky, who they have met on several occasions now, he's been to Washington quite quite often over the last three years. And of course, he's had a number of interactions with Donald Trump. Anyway, they don't particularly like him and they don't respect him and they don't trust him. They don't think that he's the sort of person that is going to be able to... Um, work successfully with the Trump administration any more than ultimately he was able to with the Biden administration either. And um, I think there are, they are completely dismissive of his so-called victory plan. And I suspect that in the end, they will probably come down against further ideas of escalation, such as supplying or agreeing to deep missile strikes against Russia. Though, again, you never know, um, people who want to appear tough, very often that is the pathway to doing foolish things. Anyway, we'll have to wait and see what it is that they're going to do. But it is important once again to stress that the situation in Ukraine is catastrophic, militarily catastrophic. I read an article, I think it might have been in Bloomberg, I think it was in the US media. I don't remember exactly where it was, but I read it yesterday. One reads so many articles in which 
the it was I think it was actually the Economist now that I revisited revisit this that the uh, that the Ukrainian military have stopped informing Zelensky himself of how bad, how actually and truly awful the military situation on the battlefields in Ukraine has actually become. Apparently, they don't, the Ukrainian military uh, have come to realize that if they shared with wider Ukrainian society uh, the truth about the awful situation in Ukraine, the level of demoralization would become unbearable and it might seriously jeopardize whatever is left of Ukraine's war effort. Well, it's bad enough that they're not sharing this information with their own people, but apparently, and one gets the sense, that they have become so frustrated and embarrassed by the volatility of their own commander-in-chief, who is, of course, Zelensky, that rather than telling the truth, they, are, they, are, they instead have a policy to sugarcoat everything and, in effect, to deceive him. It seems that General Sirsky, for example, has been told in no uncertain terms that if there is any Ukrainian retreat from Kursk region, his job is on the line. Now, I have to say, I think in that kind of situation, if faced with a statement like that, Sirsky's only option, his only honourable option, would be to tell Zelensky, well, the order that you're giving me is illogical and irrational. I can't go on pretending to you that the situation is not disastrous. <laughs> um, not only is it disastrous, but an early withdrawal from Kursk region is imperative. And if you're not prepared to ex accept that advice, then I'm going to have to resign and you'll have to appoint someone else to take my place. That, it seems to me, is what General Sirsky should do. I do understand that it is a very, very difficult thing for military officers to resign because they disagree with their commander in chief. If militaries, if that happened in militaries on a regular occasion, then of course the military would hardly able to function. But in this case, if the alternative is to just go on telling the commander in chief the things he wants to hear, which is what we're hearing, then frankly, I don't think any military officer who has any degree of self-respect and any sense of responsibility should allow himself to be placed in that kind of position. And he should be t he should tell his commander that since the commander doesn't want to hear the truth, the soldier feels that he has no option but to resign. Anyway, there we are. That's what one hears. One also reads, every so often, dribbles in the Western media about the very bad situation on the battlefronts. It's been a very interesting article in the Financial Times, which says that the, the purpose, the, the, the headline of the article is actually, again, I think, frankly, somewhat misleading. It talks about the Ukrainians and the Russians both uh, acting in order, taking various steps in order to put themselves in a superior position before Donald Trump becomes president. There's even a quote from some Ukrainian officer saying that if they can somehow stop and throw back the ongoing Russian offensive before Donald Trump becomes president. That will enable the Ukrainians to prove to Donald Trump what heroic and successful fighters the Ukrainians are. And that will persuade Donald Trump to go on supporting them. Uh, to my mind, that is utterly delusional thinking. And 
I find it very depressing that there appear to be some Ukrainian officers who still think in that way. But suffice to say that with all this, um, with all this, within all of this optimism, you find the nuggets of truth that still come through. And I'll just read part of what this article says. At several flashpoints across the 1,000 kilometer long front line, Ukrainian troops are enduring relentless Russian air and ground assaults. A commander of an artillery unit near Kurakovo, where the fighting is most intense, told the Financial Times on Monday that Russian troops were attacking from three sides. He and his troops are ready to pull back, he said, but we do not have the order from the top yet. Kurakovo and the city of Pakrovsk, 40 kilometers to the north, are both critical logistical hubs for Ukrainian, Ukraine's army and are largely destroyed. I think that is an overstatement, by the way, certainly about Pakrovsk, but it might be true of Kurakovo. The coking plant on the outskirts of Pakrovsk that has also come under attack is the largest in Ukraine and crucial to its steel manufacturing industry. Well, I've already discussed the coking plant. I suspect that Ukraine has stockpiled enough coking coal to keep producing steel at least for a while. So I don't expect that the loss of this mine is going to be quite as dramatic in its effect, at least over the next few months, as some people imagine. But anyway, to continue, CDS, the military think tank, estimated that by December, the front line will probably shift 30 to 35 kilometers west of its current position. 30 to 35 kilometers. Th that will start to bring us close to the Dnieper, <laughs> just to say. Uh, again, I, I don't know whether uh, this fact is fully understood, but if the Russians are able to advance 35 kilometers over the next few weeks, by the standards of this war, that is an exceptionally rapid, indeed devastatingly rapid advance. And then he goes on to say, Major General Dimitro Marchenko last month said that the Eastern Front was crumbling. That's apparently a direct quote. The word is in quotation marks. Or owing to shortages of ammunition and manpower. Remember how, just a short few days ago, I read an article, read out an article, I think from the New York Times, which said that the ammunition problem had been solved. <laughs> well, nobody seems to have told Major General Marchenko. He, he by the way, has uh, quit the military um, after telling the actual truth about the situation of the war. Anyway, he says that the front is crumbling because of shortages of ammunition and manpower. People are very exhausted. They simply cannot hold the fronts they are on, he said. Manpower, especially infantry, remains Ukraine's biggest challenge, according to commanders and analysts. The average age is above 40 in various brigades, and there doesn't seem to be enough reinforcements arriving on the front line. This is despite all of the massive um, mobilization we've been seeing in Ukraine since May, when the mobilization age was lowered. Um, and that comment is from uh, Franz Stefan Gadi, military analyst and fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, who recently visited Ukraine. Uh, we're then told that Ukraine is planning to draft an additional 160,000 troops between November and February, which the National Security and Defense Council believes will replenish military units to only about 85% of what is needed. There is no possibility, as we'll see in a moment, of Ukraine recruiting 160,000 men over the next few months. And 
if we're talking about men under the age of 25, which presumably we are, or men between 27 and 25, they are almost certainly lacking in basic training. And how is Ukraine going to train them so that they're ready to fill up the brigades by February, which is just a few months a few week, a few months away, and even then only to the level of 85% of what is needed. And we go on to read, military experts and one senior Kiev official have expressed scepticism that the target will be reached, saying it was more realistic to expect up to 100,000 to be drafted. I'm going to guess it's going to be less than that. That would fill about half of the manpower gap, which would still be an improvement as some units are currently staffed to about a third of what is needed. Several Ukrainian commanders and soldiers have said efforts to attract more men to the army were hampered by military service being open-ended. Kiev has been wary of passing a law on demobilization for fear it could lead to an exodus of soldiers. A lot of guys now see mobilization as a death sentence, said one senior soldier who joined the army in spring 2022 and has not had a break since. So there you go. You have it all set out there in the Financial Times. Um, the Financial Times tells us that Mariana, the, the article goes on to speak about how Mariana Bezuglaya is talking about how um, some infantry units have allegedly been bolstered with Air Force pilots and engineering medics and surgeons. We're told that um, Yuri Ignat, senior Air Force official, did confirm that some Air Force personnel had been transferred to uh, frontline units. And then we that there are others who sort of deny this. Then we read the two commanders leading units on the Eastern Front said skilled personnel, including medics, had previously been deployed to the infantry. War requires this, these things sometimes. I've sent my cooks to the trenches before. And um, then we have a comment from Darrow Massicott senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, who says that Russia was just overwhelming the Ukrainians because they have more resources now. They may not, there may not be skilled attacks, but the consistency and frequency of these things is wearing the Ukrainians down. And then, of course, we have the usual stories about the Russians suffering enormous losses, all of which is completely uncorroborated. And as Jim Webb, pointed out in the live stream we did with him yesterday on the Duran. Ultimately, those claims about these enormous Russian losses come essentially from the Ukrainians and for that reason ought to be treated with far more scepticism than they usually are. But the key thing is, put aside the usual nonsense or at least the usual claims about how unskilled the Russians are and the enormous losses they are suffering. The fact is, as uh, um, Dara Masikot says, the Russians are just overwhelming the Ukrainians they have, because they have more resources now. And the resource imbalance is simply going to grow. That is the underlying reality of the war. It is one which I think the Trump people have to some extent at least understood. J.D. Vance absolutely has understood it. But it is, in my opinion, the fundamental reality of the war as we see it now. Now, since I've referred to the Trump team, I'm going to just quote two extremely correct comments made by another important entrepreneur and billionaire, if you like, David Sachs, who, I, who is a friend of Elon Musk, 
Uh, I don't know whether he's got any actual position in the administration or forthcoming administration. I presume not. But anyway, he, he obviously knows these people. He knows, he certainly does know Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy because, as I said, I uh, went on a program which David Sachs hosted in which those two gentlemen, Ramaswamy and Musk, also participated. But David Sachs clearly does understand these realities, the realities I've just discussed, the overwhelming superiority that the Russians have. And he just made these two comments on Twitter X. He said, the simplest path to peace in Ukraine is to go back to the draft deal signed in Istanbul at the beginning of the war, but with realities on the ground. Russia has annexed the four oblasts. Everything else is a non-starter. Further delay only loses more lives and territory. That is so simply said and so completely true. And then David Sachs, obviously aware of the criticism that that comment is inevitably going to provoke from all the usual brigade of people who conjure up Munich, appeasement, um, surrender, all of that sort of thing. Anyway, he then went on to say that those so tragically wrong about everything in the Ukraine war, e.g. sanctions will cripple the Russian economy, the summer counteroffensive will succeed, Russia will be weakened, have not earned the right to lecture the rest of us about what the US must now, now must or must not do. And again, that is also so clearly and simply said, and it is absolutely true. I do hope, I really do hope that the people around Donald Trump, some of them, as I said, undoubtedly know David Sachs well, are reading these comments and are seeing the obvious sense in them, listening to the siren voices of those who've got everything wrong up to now and have brought Ukraine to this disaster that the Financial Times was laying out in this article. Listening to those siren voices is going to bring us and Ukraine even closer to the rocks, to, to the end point when there really is going to be nothing in Ukraine left. And David Sachs is also absolutely right that the only way forward is to do what Putin has said that he is open to, which is to sit down with the Russians, accept that the four regions plus Crimea are lost and sit down and negotiate on the basis of the terms that Ukraine itself seemed to be about to agree to and its negotiators actually initialed the terms that were agreed in Istanbul in April 2022, which if they had been fully agreed then, would have brought this disastrous, catastrophic and tragic war to an early end. Anyway, there we are. I think having said all of this, it's only appropriate now if I do turn to the situation on the actual front lines. I haven't talked about it in any very great detail, at least not to the usual level of detail in recent programs. But I think the time has come to start doing that now. Now, overnight, we had a huge missile, combined missile and drone attack by the Russians on Kiev. Um, the Russians launched floods of drones. We don't know how many Geranium-2 drones were sent, were launched at Kiev over the course of last night, but apparently there were dozens of them. And the Russians also launched multiple types of missiles. These included ballistic missiles, Iskander-M ballistic missiles. It also included cruise missiles, including 
KH-101 missiles launched from Russian strategic bombers. It may have included other even more advanced missiles. Um, I was recently watching a most interesting program um, on YouTube, by the way, about the Russian Sukhoi 57 fifth generation fighter jet, which has put on, by the way, a most impressive air display at the um, air show in China. I'm not going to <laughs> say more about the aircraft than that. Um, I'm just going to say that apparently, amongst other things, it has increasingly been launching its KH-69 um, subsonic stealth cruise missile, and it has been doing so to deadly effect. Ukrainian radars apparently are unable to keep track of the movement of this particular radar, of, of this particular missile. Its uh, stealth technology is defeating that of the uh, Ukrainian radar systems to the extent that they still function anymore. And I also saw a report, now this was on a Russian telegram channel, so you can either accept it or not as you choose, that the KH-101 uh, air-launched cruise missile, which is launched by the Russian strategic bombers, the Tupolev 95s, um, has now been modified extensively and its stealth qualities have been enhanced and that that has also made it much more difficult for Ukrainian radars to track and for Ukrainian missiles to intercept and destroy. Now, it was a big combined drone and missile attack on Kiev last night. I don't yet have full details as to precise as to its precise scale but it was a major attack and i don't know exactly what the targets were but a reasonable guess is that the primary targets were kiev's air defenses now kiev is about the one place in ukraine which still has functioning air defences. They only work sporadically. I've seen pictures of Russian drones and even Russian missiles flying over Kiev, sometimes in broad daylight, and there's no apparent attempt by the Ukrainians to shoot these drones and missiles down. But Ukraine, but Ukraine has concentrated a significant, perhaps the bulk of its remaining air assets, air defense assets, around Kiev itself. There was a recent pictures that were um, released of the airbase near Kiev, which showed the 10 Patriot missile launches there. The Ukrainian uh, National uh, uh, the Security and Defense Council were furious about Google's release of those pictures. Though, of course, it's an absurd complaint to make because the Russians obviously know where these launches are. It's not as if they don't have extensive satellite imagery themselves now um, on a far greater scale than they did at the, in the first weeks of the war. So anyway, um, it's likely that this major attack was directed at the air defense system in Kiev. And, of course, it could indicate that further attacks on Ukraine's energy system are coming. I was, I've been reading reports that Ukraine is already starting to, shut, to suffer from energy blackouts, from electricity blackouts. The energy system has had some repairs done to it over the last couple of weeks, but it is far below the level it needs to be in order to provide Ukraine with enough electric power to keep the lights on and the heat um, and the heat provided across Ukraine through the coming winter. And of course, the temperatures in Ukraine will also be falling by this point. So 
already the Ukrainian energy system is severely overstretched. And my own sense is that a couple more big missile strikes of the kind that the Russians have launched in the past would almost certainly suffice to bring the entire system completely to a stop. We now know, just to repeat again, point I've made in recent programs, we now know that the denial from the Russians that there were talks between themselves, the Russians and the Ukrainians, for a mutual cessation of attacks on their respective energy systems, that those reports that appeared in the Financial Times were untrue. Both Zelensky and Yermak, his chief of staff, have confirmed that there are no talks for a ceasefire in the energy war between Ukraine and the Russians. So the Russians have made no commitments to stop striking at Ukrainian energy assets. And it is highly likely that at some point over the next few weeks, the attacks on the energy assets will resume. Most probably, this attack that took place last night, targeting, as I said, the air defense system, is intended to open the way for more missile strikes targeting specifically the energy system. And those factories and industrial plants and facilities that still rely upon it. So, major Russian missile strike overnight, but also lots of news from the battlefronts, and it's becoming, as I said, increasingly difficult to keep up with the news. First of all, the front lines are so extended, 1,000 kilometers, but also events are now moving so rapidly. Now, at the very end of last week, there were reports that the Russians had begun um, an offensive in Kursk region, a third counterattack in Kursk region, seeking to recapture more of Kursk region uh, from the Ukrainians. And then on Monday, reports began to appear, and they were continued to be reported yesterday by the Daily Telegraph about how the Ukrainians had successfully repelled that Russian advance and that, in fact, the Russian advance had been a complete failure and that the Russians had suffered huge losses. Well, that was Monday, when a couple of days from then, and in fact, as I rather suspected, the realities are the exact opposite. The Ukrainians are clearly still able to resist the Russians in Kursk region. Uh, I've discussed the fact that there has been an extraordinary pileup of some of Ukraine's best brigades to Kursk region to try to hold the Russians back there. But despite that, and despite the Ukrainians trying to conduct counterattacks in a number of places, they have not been able to hold the Russians back. Not only have the Russians apparently successfully um, pushed forward and this time perhaps conclusively captured the village of Darino, which brings them very close to Sverdlikovo, by the way, um, a village which if they capture will enable the Russians to start to bring the Russians very close to the point where they're able to cut the main communication lines to the Ukrainian troops in the Kursk pocket from Ukraine itself. But the Russians apparently have made further progress. They've advanced from the village of Novo Ivanovka towards Malaya Loknia. Malaya Loknia, uh, captured by the Ukrainians apparently in the early weeks of the Ukrainian offensive into the Kursk region, then recaptured and held by the Russians for many weeks. Then a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago, there were reports that the Ukrainians, after strenuous attempts, had managed to capture it back. It looks as if the Russians are going to push them out again. They're moving from Novo Ivanovka. And 
according to some reports, they're also gradually pushing towards Malaya Loknia. From the north, they've just captured the village of Pagregbi, which is located just north of Malaya Loknia. Malaya Loknia, um, um, sorry, Pagregbi, having been under Ukrainian control, even when Malaya Loknia was held by the Russians. So, to repeat again, if the Russians are able to push through um, all the way to um, Sverdlikovo, as I said, they apparently now control Darino, Novo Ivanovka. Before long, they will control Malaya Loknia. Uh, then the Kursk pocket is going to shrink to something like a third of the size it achieved at the peak of Ukraine's offensive. And it's looking even more unstable than it has been looking for some time because south of Suja, which is the only important town <laughs> that the Ukrainians were able to capture, actually, it's not even an important town. It's a town of about five to 6,000 people, um, almost on the border. Anyway, put all that aside. It's the uh, it's the biggest place that the Ukrainians were able to capture in Kursk region. Anyway, south of Suja, apparently film evidence has now been provided by the Ukrainians, which confirms or appears to confirm that the Russians are in now in full control of Plekhovo, a village, one of the villages south of the main road to Suja, the R200 road which the Russians would need to cut in order to trap the Ukrainian troops in Kursk region. So the Russians are pushing towards this road from the north, from the northeast, from northwest to be precise, from Darin, from Lyubimovka, through Darino, ultimately perhaps aiming to capture Sverdlikovo, and they're pushing from the, from the, from the southwest, they're pushing towards this road, and they've just captured Plekhovo. With some time, perhaps, from the point when the Ukrainians are completely encircled, or rather cut off, in the Kursk region. But one can see why Sirsky apparently would want to withdraw the Ukrainians from the Kursk region, because... <laughs> Not sure how many brigades it is now, but so many of Ukraine's elite brigades are piled up there, dependent largely on a single road leading from Ukraine to a small town, Suja, with the Russians on either side of that road. It, it, it really looks like a very dreadful situation indeed, um, to put it mildly. Now that's the situation in Kursk region. And note, by the way, that all of these advances that the Russians have carried out over the last couple of days have not involved this mythical 50,000 man force that we've been reading about in the New York Times and the Washington Post nor is there any sign of the North Korean soldiers playing any role for the moment in the fighting. I'm not saying that there aren't any North Koreans there, but so far, at least, it's all the Russians and they are advancing in Kursk region and the Ukrainians, despite sending many of their elite brigades there, are falling back. Since I was talking about Ukrainian brigades, by the way, I should say that there was an interesting article yesterday in the Russian newspaper, Redovka, which is a Russian newspaper, very, very strongly supportive of the war, very critical of Ukraine. But nonetheless, I think a reasonably reliable media outlet, at least where the war is concerned. Anyway, Redovka made a very interesting claim that the Ukrainians have a practice, a mistaken practice 
are when they mobilize and train men. Instead of sending them as reinforcements to rebuild, to, to reinforce existing brigades, they divert an unusually large proportion of these fresh and newly trained soldiers to create entirely new brigades, most of which are massively under strength, uh, sometimes being no more than a battalion or two battalions strong. And these brigades, these small raw brigades, are sometimes briefly deployed to the battlefronts, but then almost immediately and quickly pulled back again. And Radovka suggested that the reason that happens is because the Ukrainian military leadership <laughs> is very wary of deploying many of the newly conscripted soldiers, particularly those from the higher end demographics, the more wealthy demographics in Ukraine, to the actual frontline brigades because they fear the repercussions of heavy losses amongst the soldiers of these demographics. So they tick the box of the mobilization by recruiting men from these demographics. But instead of reinforcing the brigades that could actually use these soldiers, they set about creating new brigades, basically to keep these conscripts as far as is possible out of harm's way. I don't know whether that is true, but it's an interesting, it was an interesting article. And knowing what I do about Ukraine, it wouldn't surprise me. Anyway, so the situation in the Kursk region is deteriorating. It's deteriorating incrementally. The Russians gradually shrinking the pocket. Going back to what Jim Webb said, Marine officer, former Marine officer, very familiar with these, this kind of war. He said that the Russians have no pressing desire to end the existence of the Kursk pocket too quickly. The Ukrainians reinforce it. They send more and more of their men there. This is a perfect way for the Russians to keep to maintain attrition against these best, these best elite Ukrainian brigades. It keeps those brigades aware, away from the other parts of the battlefronts where um, the Ukrainian defences are crumbling. The Kursk pocket, from a Russian point of view, is the gift that goes on giving. So why be in a hurry to shut it down? Cut it up one piece at a time. Inflict as many losses on the Ukrainians as you can. Weaken their brigades. Tie them down. Eventually, obviously, you will have to clear it, but do it in the way that will be most damaging to Ukraine and which will inflict the most losses on the Ukrainian army in the process. So, that's course. Lots of things happening in other places. I'm going to skip Siversk, Chasovia, and uh, Toretsk, though I'm sure lots is going on there too. But we've had reports from the um, uh, Russian military, from TASS, about um, what's going on in um, Kupiansk. Um, the um, Russians are saying that they have successfully gained a foothold in Kupiansk. This was said by Andrei Marochko, our old friend. <laughs> he told TASS that in a few days, our frontline units managed to advance and established a foothold in the area northeast of the settlement of Kupiansk. Ukrainian troops responded by withdrawing their personnel and equipment from some areas, whilst also actively defending the city. And that is consistent with the Russians having broken into Kupiansk itself and occupied this area, basically on the north, where eastern outskirts of Kupiansk, 
um, east of the Oskol River, including the football stadium that we've been hearing so much about. So anyway, the Russians making advances in Kupiansk. And, well, I uh, discussed, I spoke how in the Financial Times, the Ukrainian soldiers apparently want to withdraw from Kurakovo. Um, they understand how bad the situation there is. And we get a similar report um, about that in the Financial Times, by the way. I'm um, oh, sorry, in the Intas. Sorry, we, we had a report about that in Financial Times. But then uh, Denis Pushilin, the head of the Donetsk People's, Re People's Republic, uh, has said that Russian forces were cutting off supplies to the Ukrainian group in Kurakovo and encircling the town, very similar to what we hear in the Financial Times. And the Russians are also saying that the destruction by the Ukrainians of the dam, the Kurakovo dam, um, actually is working to the Russian the Russians' advantage. Uh, the Ukrainian army's move to blow up the dam of the Kurakovo reservoir helps Russian forces cross it once the level water level falls and the water freezes after frosty weather sets in. And that's been said by our old friend Andrei Marochko. Uh, um, and then we're told that a security official, that's another person, uh, told TASS earlier that the Ukrainians had exposed their own positions to flooding after blowing up the Kurakovo dam. At least 10 Ukrainian soldiers were killed. In addition, basements where civilians could have been fight hiding were flooded. This experience shows that by blowing up dams, they're helping us out. Let's, let's say this is because the water levels drop and it becomes much easier to cross the water barrier. And since the temperature will soon fall below zero, our forces will be able to drive lighter armoured vehicles there, something the Ukrainian general staff and their handlers at NATO headquarters must have overlooked. And this was said by Marochko. So anyway, turning to the situation in this general area, we've had further news of Russian advances. Um, the um, village of Ilinka, north of the Kurakovo Reservoir, has supposedly fallen completely under Russian control. The Russians supposedly are closing in on villages, further villages of Petropavlivka and uh, uh, west of Sonsivka, which the Russians are supposedly storming, <laughs> and south in south of the reservoir in Kurakovo itself, the Russians are continuing to advance and there are reports that they have also captured now, that they have completed the capture of the village of Danye and that the Ukrainian troops in those, in those other villages, the villages of um, um, Uspenivka, and Yelizavetivka and Antonovka and all of those villages, that the Ukrainian troops in these places are now starting to withdraw, again, very much like Marochko and the Financial Times have say, are saying, and Pushilin is saying, because the situation around Kurakovo has become impossible. And we have also had more news, and it's actually quite dramatic news from uh, the um, Velika Novosilka area uh, further to the um, west. Um, the Russian defense ministry has now confirmed that the village of Rov Rivnopil is under Russian control, that the Russians have continued to advance in this whole area around Velika Novosilka. Uh, this is placed to the west of Ugladar and directly north of the Vremevka salient. There are suggestions that the Russians will have captured, will be in a position to capture Velika Novosilka within a few days. 
And I've also heard some reports that the Russians have captured other villages to the north of Velika Novosilka as well, which suggests that the Ukrainian garrison in that village is also about to be surrounded. So the Russian advance everywhere continues and is accelerating. And, well, the Financial Times says that they could be 35 kilometers west by some point in December. The Economist, I think it was The Economist, says that the military is lying to Zelensky about how bad the situation is. And the Russians now slicing up the Kursk pocket, conducting massive missile strikes on Kiev, perhaps preparing for a major offensive against Ukraine's energy system over the next few weeks. Let me repeat again, there is no reason here for Putin to negotiate or to compromise on any substantive position. Those who expect him to do, I am sure are going to be disappointed. To repeat again, if the Trump administration is wise, they will listen to the points made by David Sachs in those two messages on Twitter X, posts on Twitter X that I read out earlier, that the right thing for the Ukrainians to do is to go back to Istanbul, accepting the loss of the four regions and Crimea. That the right thing for the Americans to do is to encourage the Ukrainians to do that very thing that those who have been consistently wrong about this war since the outset, who have consistently predicted one victory after another, which has failed to happen, <laughs> one Ukrainian victory after another, and the collapse of the sanctions and the fall of um, Putin's regime and all of those things, that they are not in a position, having been so comprehensively proved wrong, to go on lecturing all the rest of us, and certainly not the government of the United States, about what its future course in this war should be. Zelensky continues to rule out negotiations. At the Budapest summit that happened just a few days ago of the European leaders, he again insisted that the only acceptable outcome to the war was his peace plan, which required all the territory of pre-2014 Ukraine to be returned to the control of Kiev. The time has come. The United States has, is in a position to say to Zelensky, this is all completely unrealistic. The United States has done all that it can. Brian Lanza, when he pointed all that out, maybe he wasn't talking about Donald Trump. But he was saying, stating the reality. The right thing for the Ukrainians to do is to come up with a realistic negotiating strategy. This is the one mentioned by David Sachs in his post. Sit down with the Russians. Try to find an end to the war. Obviously, the terms will, from a Ukrainian point of view, be bitter ones. But the alternative is further disaster, further tragedy, further loss of life and the potential end of Ukraine. If you have what, from a Ukrainian perspective, is a bad outcome, and set that off against a catastrophic outcome. The rational choice is to go for the bad outcome, however difficult and bitter doing that might, might, might be. And any step by the new government of the United States to try to turn things around, to persuade the Ukrainians to go on fighting, 
will simply compound the tragedy for Ukraine, which is already huge, and compound the geopolitical embarrassment that the United States is going to suffer as a result of the folly of the policy that the Biden administration adopted. Well, this is where I finish my program today. There'll be more from me soon. Let me remind you again, you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar and by going to our shop, links under this video. Last but not least, if you've liked these programs, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.